Welcome back to the Guardian Project Podcast. This is episode 144, and I'm your host, Andy. And some weeks I have great intros, and others, you know, they might be a flop. It's all trial and error. Oh, nice. Very nice. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of that one. (laughs) And I'm your other host, Mike, and I recently started putting Painter's Servant in all of my decks to increase their power level. You know what they say, back to the grindstone. Infinite Mill. Gotta love Mm -hmm. it. We do. Please listen carefully. And this is the podcast where we talk about all things Magic the Gathering. But mostly Commander. So we have uh, some short announcements today. Uh, First, there was um, an announcement related to the new Capenna Commander deck availability. Uh, The announcement says due to supply chain issues, there will be less availability of Streets of New Capenna Commander decks in the US and Canada than was originally planned in time for its release coming up next month on April 29th. Oh my gosh, I can't believe we're already there. I know. Um, It says that they do not anticipate other uh, Streets of New Capenna products to be impacted. So, um, you know, check with your local game store and confirm when they're going to have those commander decks and their commander launch party events um, for you. Um, they do say that there will be more of this product available after release um, and they'll, they'll post an announcement. So uh, right away, we might not be able to get our hands on those commander decks. Oh, how it's disappointing. How Although it'll come, we don't even know what they are yet. To be honest, I know. I well, we 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 assume they're all going to be three color. Three colors. And there's going to be five of them. So I'm already excited just based on that. Are they going to have two partners in the deck? Oh, I hope, and I hope they're Could original partners it? that are like absolutely busted, bonkers, broken, like the original partners. Like, you want like two color partners in there? Yeah, for, I want like one is two color and one's one color. I want I want a Thrasios level commander. Uh, with no. partner that is blue and black <laughs> rather than blue and green. That's what I want. Uh, wow. I see you're not a fan of Silas Wren then. Well, uh, not I'm as much. Tell him. That's I'm going to tell him you said that. That's fine. Tell him. <laughs> <laughs> we also have two new patrons to welcome. Uh, welcome, Bert and Geek Beardly. Thank you so much for your support and welcome to the project. Yeah. If, uh, if you could print out the project and like put it in a binder or something, sign your names on it. That's like the last thing we have to do for this particular assignment. Um, and, and any further projects, you know, those are going to be new projects. This one, I think, is finally <laughs> done. Is this... Have we been working on this project since we started our Patreon? Is this the first project? Yeah, like it, like lore wise in my head, oh, yes, that's where I yeah. have it. Well, we put a lot of work into that project. It better be pristine. It's, it better be. We're gonna good. get an A, or they're gonna be like eh, a B. Wow. Overachievers. Well, as long as I pass, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's all that matters. That is all that matters. <laughs> now, if you want to support us, you can head to patreon.com slash guardian project pod and donate for any dollar amount. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all of your support. And if you're looking for another way to support the podcast, whatever platform you are enjoying the podcast on now, if you could subscribe, rate, review, and leave comments, we would be most appreciative. And you can find us online. uh, We're on YouTube. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. You can Google Guardian Project Podcast and you'll find us. We have a Gmail account. So email us sometime. Um, Mike, what are we talking about today? It's a very excited, exciting day for us today. We have another patron exclusive episode. This is a patron reward for our patron, Nick Martin, who is on to talk to us a little bit about Budget Commander. All right. I'll go get Nick. Nick, welcome to our show. This is our, I believe, second ever patron exclusive episode. And we are so excited to have you here to talk about Budget Commander. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, this is this is great. Um, we have followed you uh, online for a, a long time. One of one of the uh, our friends that we've actually met in real life, and we know that you're all about commander on a budget. So tell us about you. You know, uh, when did you start playing Magic, and how did you get into Budget Commander? So uh, my name's Nick. Obviously, you already said that already. Uh, I started playing obviously. Magic in. Uh, college, it was to break my World of Warcraft addiction. Uh, oh. Turns out it worked, and now I'm <laughs> playing this game instead of another one. So, you know, I guess it worked. Yeah, I started playing in 2009, uh, right before the, like, the Mimeoplasm and all, like, the very first Commander decks came out. So, been playing for a little over, a uh, little over a decade, I think, so. 
Wow. That's a long time. Now, I do, I, I just, I think it's kind of ironic in a way. <laughs> We're talking about Budget Commander, and you came from a game that had a $15 a month uh, subscription. I imagine you probably spend more than $15 a month on Magic the Gathering, though. <laughs> Yeah, in hindsight, I would have saved a lot more money <laughs> <laughs> if you hadn't changed. <laughs> um, so we're really excited. We've talked about Budget Commander um, before on our show, just in different capacities. We've had our own budget games. We have budget gameplay. Um, we have been on other shows and played uh, with budget decks. So why don't we start off, Nick, by having you tell us uh, what your definition of budget commander is and what we're really going to talk about today. So kind of a loaded question, I, I suppose. <laughs> so uh, so in magic, the term budget has somewhat of a negative connotation to it. Mm -hmm. uh, keeping it simple, budget in magic means inexpensive. And usually when people think of inexpensive cards, their brain autocorrects to bad or suboptimal. Uh, it's not necessarily true, especially in commander. Uh, just because every other green card draw spell isn't the Great Henge doesn't mean it's bad. Like, Return of the Wildspeaker is an amazing card. If you're not playing it, go pick it up. It's like a buck. Oh, yeah. Um, getting back to the question, so what is budget in terms of Commander? Uh, for some, it's picking up a pre-con and playing it right out of the box. For others, it's making the choice up front to not include best in-slot picks for certain functions of your deck, like removal, draw, and ramp. Uh, maybe you don't want to, uh, you know price yourself out of your home play group uh maybe you want to just play some old janky cards that you have from your collection that'll make your friends go wow i didn't know that card existed uh maybe you want the cred and bragging rights of taking down a high powered casual pod with your 20 dollar zadra hedron grinder deck mm -hmm. uh maybe you just want to play with stuff you own in your collection and never buy to their pack again uh there's tons of examples of what constitutes as a budget deck and commander uh but if i had to guess what the main unifying theory of it is is that you want to play the game, have fun with your friends, or soon-to-be friends, without breaking the bank. Cost does not equate to fun in a social format. Okay, okay. I, I actually uh, particularly like the um, parallel that you have there with, with pre-cons. You know, some people could, could consider a pre-con budget. If you're picking up a pre-con from, like, not your LGS, if you're picking it from, like, Meyer or Target or something like that, it's costing, like, $45, so... Um, I, I oftentimes see a, a budget target for decks and stuff being around $50. And so I really, really like that comparison between the two. But I think you're absolutely right. You know, it, it's relative, right? Depending on who it is. We know um, in, in our one of our local play groups, we have a friend that has a budget Najila deck. And it's definitely relatively budget. Um, I mean, it plays all of the shock lands, which a lot of people would think, oh, that's not budget anymore. But then when you look at literally every other card in the deck, it, I mean, the overall deck cost is I think sub one hundred dollars. So um, it's you know it, I, I like I like the I like your your framing of the definition here because I, I definitely do think it is relative. I I think a lot of people have have that feeling because there's I've seen people say well it's it's a budget deck I only played with cards that I own, but if you've played like like you you said Nick that you've been playing since two thousand and nine ish, you probably have a bigger card pool selection than someone that started playing let's say you know two years ago so you may have on hand three hundred dollars worth of a deck versus someone who has on hand you know thirty five dollars worth of a deck right yeah that's exactly right i mean the people who've been playing since alpha probably have their you know their dual lands that they got for i don't know they probably cost a quarter back in the day who knows Back um, in my day, these were two dollars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I wish, I wish, what I wouldn't give to have a few of those. <laughs> and now they cost more than your car payment, so you know <laughs> they sure do. They sure do. Now, um, what about when it comes to like like typical budgets or anything? Like, do you have a typical budget? I know I, I had just mentioned the fifty dollar, uh, and maybe that's a target. Um, but is that is I mean is fifty dollars your typical budget or is there a typical budget when you when you go about deck building for a, a budget deck? Uh, it kind of depends on what I'm looking for. Um, so for me, building a budget commander deck usually involves looking at a card, whether it's a commander or something neat like Skeletal Swarming, and thinking, "Hey, what can I do with this and the cards I own?" And maybe fifty bucks. Um, the fifty to one hundred dollar range, in my opinion, is perfect peak budget commander. Uh, you get a good range of cards with flexibility to power up or down depending on what your play group needs or what you want your deck to do. And then you can still reasonably compete with some of the higher powered casual decks out there. 
Uh, you also have the added benefit of not completely outpacing a precon. Uh, and if you haven't been paying attention to the precons lately, they're kind of gross now. <laughs> they're <laughs> like, really, they're yeah, really they good. They're really, really good. Like, you don't even have to, like, spend 50 bucks. You can spend 40 bucks and you can start taking down people who've been playing longer than I have. No problem. Yeah, we just had a we just had a stream um, where where someone was playing the Chishiro uh, precon from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, and it kept up really really well with all of the other decks. So and and funny you say that. A few weeks ago, I was on another stream where the same precon, the Chishiro deck, the the modified deck that I feel like we definitely didn't. I I don't think we evaluated it right because I looked at it and was like, nah, I don't know if I like this deck. Right. It 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 wiped the board with us. It was so consistent so so strong so um you can definitely get really really powerful decks um on a budget so um do you think though that that you know more decks that are on a budget are playing less colors so how many colors affect budgets right uh in my experience the more colors you have in your deck the more expensive it's gonna be uh, a lot of that uh, as uh, as mike mentioned has to do with the land base uh, but I like to think about it a different way. Uh, the more colors your deck has, the slower it's going to be. Uh, you can build a five-color deck for less than 50 bucks uh, with land base of, like, guild gates, basics, and a command tower. And you can still, you know, take people out of the game in round turn 8 or 10, depending on what you did. Uh, for example, uh, I built my first and only five-color deck uh, ever. It's Corona the Falls God, uh, back when Maze's End came out. Uh, I spent 25 bucks in college. I didn't have much. <laughs> and uh you know the more tap lands it had way more tap lands than you can shake a stick at like mm -hmm. we weren't doing anything until like turn four it's still one games uh it still does to this day uh i've put some more money into the deck it's all about shrines now and everything uh the land base is still largely untouched it plays even more gates <laughs> than it used to before because there's more now uh yeah. so if you want a more like recent example uh one of my co-hosts on scrap trawlers andy zupke he's got a 50 dollar sisse weatherlight captain deck uh, and that's absolutely terrifying. Land base is all basics. Uh, some of those try coming to play tap lands. And cheap five, cheap, uh, five color lands like Exotic Orchard, uh, Command Tower, and Path of Ancestry. Um, you know, some of the budget goes to that, but it's maybe $5 or less if I had to, t if I had to guess. Um, also, let's, let's put a hot take on here, right? <laughs> yeah. So I talked about Corona, then I talked about Sisse, the new Sisse. Um... The formula, the new formula for five color legends that are easy to cast but still need all five colors to do something, I think is a good thing. Uh, it's more fun game design, in my opinion, because it's a lot more forgiving and better for new players. Mm -hmm. So you're a Golos fan, is what is what you're saying right now. Overall, you yeah, love, I like Bang you cards. love Golos. Who doesn't? Can you can you say can you say <laughs> for the for the crowd out there that you love Golos? I love Golos. All right, we got it on record. We will say though that after that did happen and Golos was banned, Mike, you you played more against Golos after the banning than yep. any other time throughout the year. It, we didn't particularly have many off you know off level games with that, but I will say though that looking at this Corona the False God, I have lost to that deck of yours, and I I I saw the writing on the wall. Everybody in the pod told me it was it was happening and that it. I should be doing something about it. And I was like, nah, it's just, there's not that much being done right now. And then it is, it was too far. I, I let you go too far. <laughs> and um, I couldn't come back from that. <laughs> and I think that talks to the power of budget decks because you can make extremely powerful decks on a budget because there are, there are still some of the cards that a lot of commanders use that just synergize really well with them that are that are affordable and like you said earlier we, you might be losing out on on i'm, I'm using air quotes here like staples uh, of the format people talk about cards like cyclonic rift a lot i mean sure you're not going to add a cyclonic rift into a budget deck but obviously budget is relative but i've seen some really powerful budget decks um that could i think probably easily take out some of my non-budget decks yeah, for sure. So is there something um, maybe, Nick, that you could talk about to, you know, the powerful cards of, uh, you know, opening up your pool to a larger uh, pool of more powerful cards when you go into those multiple colors um, versus being able to streamline everything into single colors? Like so, so the the benefits that you get actually for for having five colors or multiple colors. 
Yeah, so in my experience, uh, the number of colors doesn't dictate how powerful a budget deck can be. It just dictates at what speed you're going to run at. Uh, more colors open up the door to do more powerful things, but it might take a little longer to get there. Uh, and they're not necessarily more powerful, but there's a potential higher number of powerful things you can do. Uh, for example, mono red and mono green players, really good at dealing damage via creatures or spells, but you kind of need to pick one or the other to streamline the process. If you mix them together, you can do both, but probably not as fast. Okay, that makes sense. And I guess to 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 play back on the um, you know five color commanders that have been easier to cast, I just want to compare really quick Sisse Weatherlight Captain to your Corona the False God. So Sisse being a three mana where you only need white to cast it, Corona you need all five colors. I mean, is that in your Corona deck? Are you act, are you casting your commander every game, or is it? maybe just a commander you have there in order to open up to five colors. Uh, for that commander specifically, it was uh, the reason I picked Corona is one, because it was, I think it was one of the cheapest ones I could actually find out in the wild. Uh, this was when card shark was a thing. <laughs> ah, <laughs> if anybody yes. remembers that. Yeah. So uh, that's what I had. And uh, I just wanted to play all the vows in the original commander decks. Ah. You know, put it on Corona and have her go around the table and then use a pillow fort option so she can't swing back at you. That was like the whole thing for it. <laughs> Seeing now, though, that this is it, or at least hearing about it and you've got a good amount of enchantments. Are are you looking at changing that out at all to go Shintai of life's origin? So I did actually get a go Shintai thanks to somebody on the podcast. So I think. Oh my much. gosh. <laughs> wow. It was me. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought about it and uh, I kind of like the story of having Corona, the false God and like just having a bunch of shrines, really weird shrines to this false God. It sets um, like a really funny story. Plus you get to like make a bunch of random no flying spirits and then pump them with Corona. So that's kind of funny. Uh, so I don't think I'll be changing spirits. the commander. Uh, and it also, you know, you get to, Say like, hey, I'm playing this shrine stack that has nothing to do with with the shrine. So maybe people won't kill you first. <laughs> now, is that it? Can that ever really be considered a budget deck? Given that the the token shrines cost like ten dollars a piece. Like, do you include do you include tokens in your budget there, Nick? No, and I don't have to because nobody owns the shrine tokens. <laughs> <laughs> I think we each got we got lucky. So Mike and I we each opened I think like one. Oh, yeah, we wow. got lucky that that our printing of the set booster box we got was the lucky one that did in fact have them included, mm -hmm. but we did not open many. Um, but we do love infinite tokens and we love our, our podcast dry erase tokens. So uh, not a problem if you don't have those. Um, so talking about the colors of budget commander decks, do you think that there are any colors that you could build, the color uh, of a deck that uh, would be inherently more expensive than one of the other colors? Um, sort of. So the majority of colors, uh, you can all build them for relatively cheap. Uh, but in my experience, white-based decks run a little more on the expensive side. Uh, there's a big reason for that. I think it's because white doesn't have too many good ramp or draw options. So okay. when something like uh, something, something is printed, it could be priced out immediately. Uh, depending on what your budget range is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Because we've seen a lot of those those catch-up things. So you've got the Archaeomancer's map, which is very expensive. Mm -hmm. Is it Keep, Keeper of the Accord? Is that the one that does creatures and lands, I feel like? That is, sounds is, right. Is, is that the one? Yep. I know that that's out of out of budget do you um another question when looking at a budget do you have like a, a cap that you try to stick for each card or do you just have an overall budget for the whole deck uh normally i just have like an overall budget yeah. uh for the deck so like we've, we've had some instances where um some people in our local play group are like yeah i got a 50 dollar deck uh one of my cards is literally half my budget because i just want to play it <laughs> mm -hmm. sure and so like you can do that um normally i think on average most of my cards are two dollars and below just to try to keep it uh you know, try, try, to, try to keep it super cheap some right. things will jump up and you know become five dollars but you should be fine and and when they do that do you edit i've seen folks that play with budget decks that they they will take that out when it hits a certain price that they keep it down do you do that or like once it's built you're, you're good to keep that uh, I, I do both so if i'm if i'm really okay with with how a deck feels i'll just leave it alone uh for example i got a verizal deck that we uh that we built again on scrap trawlers uh, it was a one dollar edh deck where every card can't cost more than a dollar okay uh so i liked it so much and then i uh 
I wanted to break the budget a little bit, just going to a standard $50. Uh, some of the cards have spiked since then, but like it's way more fun to play. Yeah, definitely. I know. So Verizal, that's the um, the kicker legendary creature. Yeah. Yes, correct? the Simic Kicker one. Simic Kicker. Whenever you cast a kick spell, you may remove two plus one plus one counters if you do copy it. Oh, nice. Okay, so this seems like that would be pretty easy to build on a budget. We have a lot of plus one plus one counter synergies, so... Yes, definitely. Yeah. That is one of the strategies that's really easy to do. Also, just picking up Kicker as a draft mechanic. Um, nobody wants the cards except for Red <laughs> Replication. So you can pick up things pretty cheap. Yeah, and we know that that can, that can change over time, right? So if they bring out another Zendikar set and all of a sudden there's some commander with, that is good with Kicker and it's a five-color Kicker commander or something and it just blows everything out of the water, those cards could spike later i know um we have some decks that we built a long time ago andy and myself i know i have like an erixmathes the slumbering isle um sea monsters and krakens deck when i built it it was 25 bucks because no one really wanted the only the only time you were playing with sea monsters and krakens is maybe like the original joyra who who put um time counters on things so you could cast them for free like three turns later um but then you know you started getting into um innistrad the newest innistrad sets uh, and you got Stormkirk in there that's that's you know helping with all of the Krakens and the Leviathans. And and that deck for me, I know, has gone up to at least fifty dollars now when it was originally built on a twenty-five dollar budget. Yeah, it turns out when everybody starts playing magic because the game's great, the cards get more expensive. <laughs> it's it's like <laughs> supply and demand. Supply and demand. I, I built a uh, Gerard Golgari Lichlord fling deck, which has since been changed from budget to non-budget, but I do remember that um when I initially built it, there were a couple of combo cards that went with it. You know, who? it's me playing combos, let's be real. And um, now some of those cards are, are much more expensive. Um, and if I were to go revert back to that original build, I don't think I could play it with that same group um, <laughs> if we were trying to stick under that budget, which is wild. Now, restriction brings creativity, right? So we're playing with different cards than we would play normally. Um, we, we've talked about it. There, there, there might be some homogenization with certain strategies or certain commanders or just the format in general. Um, are there certain strategies that you would say are easier to build around on a budget? Yeah. Would you believe me if I said combo? Hmm. I yes uh sign me up <laughs> <laughs> so um so we do a, a weekly tweet called the the bulk bin combo every Wednesday uh also a you know other co-host of the show uh Lenny Woolley uh handles all the uh, suggestions for that you'd be surprised how many infinites there are at a dollar or less like a dollar and it works so well on a budget because no one sees it coming uh, everyone expects the budget player to be less of a factor, so you can get away with a lot of jank until it's too late. It's kind of like uh, playing Mario Kart, you know, where it's like, oh, I'm going to pick this like weird character. You only want to be in second place until the final lap, and then you just go. And mm -hmm. like everyone's already like beating the crap out of each other, and you got all of your gas, and you're just going. You literally have the blue shell. Yeah. But you're in second place. You're like, get wrecked. Second place I'm coming, blue bro. shell. <laughs> What'd you say? Second place blue shell? Is that a thing? You held it. You held you, you were in you, hold on you were in eighth and then you 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 got to second and then you threw it. Oh, your your restraint much better than mine. <laughs> much better. Okay, let's say it's Mario Kart double dash, Ooh. throw back to the GameCube, yeah. where I believe you were able to hold two items. Each character had their own. Yeah. So Get to eighth, get a blue shell, flip the character, then just play with your regular items until you get to second. <laughs> Perfect. That's all I need. <laughs> so um, we we have seen those bulk bin combo tweets. So, so that that is great. And I agree. I think there are a lot of very budget combos um, that people can play. So that's actually really great um, uh, that that you have ways to close out games. Because I do think that a lot of people say or, or associate budget decks with a type of commander that is just play creatures and swing creatures and stall out the board state and play a three hour game. And that's really not what budget commander is. It's, it's not just play big creature, turn big creature sideways. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. You know, when it, when it comes to, to, to you, I mean, you could literally do everything with budget, you know, Typically, when I focus on budget, and I'm looking at creatures. I'm looking at enter the battlefield triggers because I find that those particular creatures, you know, they might be costed a little bit more 
Um, but they have the ability to go search for lands or something on ETB, which also could be something you play into a, on a more like a five color deck or something like that. Um, but it's it's definitely, you know, not necessarily just swinging creatures. Like you said, combos, um, ghostly flickers, one of my favorite budget cards like of all time because you get to blink two things, uh, combo it with like an Archaeomancer so that you can return ghostly flicker back to your hand. And I think that particular combo might also be under a dollar right there. So um, budget strategies you could even do uh, i know we've beaten gotten beaten by storm strategies even before in budget uh, i believe it was a kess storm deck that we lost to before uh, that being said you know you still could get killed by turning sideways you know maybe oh, it's a, for sure a giant dinosaur bird or something although i guess it probably doesn't turn sideways if it has vigilance but you know what we mean when we say that do you think do you think Voltron strategies are easy to build on a budget? Because when I think about Voltron, just other strategies, I guess, that you could build on a budget, a lot of a lot of those equipment that you can play can be affordable. You don't have to play all of the sort of X and X and Ys. Um, do you do you think that um, I guess other uh, strategies that are easier to build on a budget? Uh, Voltron is one of those. Yes, and it's also one that uh, excels pretty well at the uh, at the budget range. Uh, so your your plan is extremely streamlined. You're just playing, you know, depending on what your commander needs. Uh, you're playing your, your pump spells, if they're auras, equipment, counters, what have you. And you're just, you know, you're just kind of going to town. You only need the one... You have one part of your strategy right in there in the command zone. It's always going to be there. So you can just yeah. suit it up, go to town. And, and as you said, you don't really need Swords of X and Y to do a lot of damage. I mean, Colossus Hammer is, what, <laughs> like a, a dime? Mm-hmm. You put that on yeah. a double striker, you're going to win games. Yeah. First, first you use my favorite budget card when your creature's small, access tunnel. You give it <laughs> un, un you can't it can't be blocked by a creature of power three or greater. Then you suit it up on a budget. Yeah, see? And access tunnel's 35 cents. Yeah. We got we got our strategy here. Now, on the flip side, are there strategies that are more difficult to build on a budget versus uh, I guess maybe even more accessible um, when you don't have a restriction? Um, yeah, tribal for sure is probably, in my opinion, the most difficult to build on a budget. Uh, it's one of the more popular casual strategies, and a lot of the traditional staples are just way too expensive to include unless you already own them, uh, like Coat of Arms and Adaptive Automaton. Uh, some of the more saturated tribes, though, like zombies, come with some exceptions. Uh, Mike, as you probably know, uh, there are so many zombie lords now. Yeah, and are. we just got that pre-con deck, so you can probably find a critical mass of on-the-bench cards that you don't normally include in, like, you know, the non-budget version of a deck. And you get nearly the same effect. Uh, so if you find a pre-con for a tribe that you have some interest in for a reasonable, pr reasonable price, just go and buy it. I'm, I'm fully convinced that you could actually build a zombie commander deck with nothing but zombie lords and still have a very high percentage of your deck be creatures. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, this is this is probably possible. Um, I didn't think about the fact that a tribal deck would be more expensive. Having a, a humans deck, they're, they're, I guess I just run a lot of just generically good humans that they, they probably only cost a few bucks. But a few bucks adds up when you're running, you know, 30 creatures yeah. in, in a deck and you want them all to be valuable, uh, you know, in some way. Yeah, I don't think I don't think tribal ever came up in our most expensive or least expensive um, episodes when we were talking about deck themes and stuff. I know least expensive. We saw uh, auras, which definitely fits to the Voltron uh, theme. I don't know if that will actually still be true with all of the um, aura uh, uh, legendary creatures that we got. I cared about auras like Chishiro and um, the Sultai Toad uh, that we also got in Kamigawa Neon <laughs> oh, Dynasty. Oh, Tatsunari. And Tatsunari. Um, so maybe the aura strategy isn't the cheapest anymore, but I know on the most expensive strategy um, it, it talked about more about like the control side and wheeling and all that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, I don't know. It, it is... is is there a way that you can build those types? Like, are there certain types of decks that you absolutely can't build on a budget? No, I, I'm pretty sure you can you can build anything you would want to on a budget. Storm, uh, specifically, might be a little bit more difficult, mostly because you want a lot of cost reducers for Storm, right? I used to play uh, Gift Storm in Modern, mm -hmm. and having a cost reducer... It, it's cost reducer or nothing. I mean, you can have a bunch of rituals, but if you're not reducing your spells, you're not getting anywhere. Right. And a lot of the cost reducers, 
like uh, Emerald Medallion and all of that, uh, those are pretty expensive. I mean, some of those are even more than a deck, depending on which one you need. <laughs> yeah, Sapphire Medallion, Jet Medallion, reprints, please. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, we need those again. I think they were last we reprinted did. in one of the, the Planeswalker Commander decks. Uh, we may have gotten one on the list or something at some point, but... I think right now, Sapphire Medallion is on the list currently. Mm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> because that is the only one that I owned um, that I opened. Um, because I, I got lucky and got that one. I said, well, there, that's a good list card to get and not the three-cent card that's been printed 19 times. Oh, um, yeah. But, yeah, pr- print them. Print them, please. We, we could <laughs> use that. Uh, I would assume... Just just looking at a couple of popular themes that maybe even Planeswalkers would be probably, Super Friends would be, probably be difficult to do on a budget. But we do have some options now. And there are some really affordable Planeswalkers that after, after a set has been out for a while, if it didn't do a ton in standard, it usually is a pretty affordable card to pick up for Commander. Granted, not every Planeswalker is great in a format where... It might not make a creature or be able to protect itself or do something wild to, to affect a game of four people. Um, I would assume that and uh, may, maybe even aristocrat strategies only looking mm-hmm. at at the sack outlets. But you can easily replace a sack outlet of, of, of an Ashnod's altar and Phyrexian altar with with a sack outlet that's a, a very affordable creature. So I, I, I feel like aristocrats would probably also be pretty easy to do. You just have to make sure you can afford a uh, you know like a blood artist or a Zulaport cutthroat type effect. Those are probably going to be on the higher end mm-hmm. of of the cards in, in those decks to kind of make the strategy work, right? Yeah, yeah. You kind of have to get creative. Um, there's a slug from I think it's like Cold Snap or Ice Age. It costs five mana, but you can sack a creature for free to add a red to your pool. So you can put that in like a birdie combo deck if you want to like get a bunch of mana and get a bunch of like death triggers from uh your outpost siege and whatnot you can still do those strategies you just gotta you gotta look a uh, look under some rocks yeah that's yeah. a thermo thermopod i believe is what that creature is called that's the one got it and you got like carrion feeder which is the one mana zombie um that that i, I think that card was was reprinted so it might be yeah, it mo- might be modern, affordable modern now. horizons one was the reprint yeah modern horizons one was a reprint nice well um I do, I do like seeing also comparing a, a deck that's budget of a certain strategy to a deck of it that's that's like not budget. And, and I would say, I, I think a lot of the changes that people make, and we've talked about it on the show before, is I think a lot of people start with the mana base first, right? It's one of your easiest ways to, to change up a deck to make it more consistent. But a lot of the core cards in my decks that I think work together didn't really care about the budget to begin with. There's a lot of sub one dollar cards i guess maybe aside from some maybe some staples you know if you're looking at like rampant growths and cultivates and things like that that wouldn't change too much between a a budget deck and a non-budget deck yeah so um do we do you think nick that you know those particular uh staples and stuff i guess is it is it being able to play some being not be able to play some like how is that going to affect the power level of your deck on a budget um so Good news for that. Uh, you really don't need. I'm, I'm a Soul Ring apologist. Uh, thankfully, Soul Ring is like <laughs> less than a buck. It's a great equalizer. Like Soul Ring is not the most powerful busted like fast mana in the format, but everybody has it. So I mean, th- they keep reprinting Rampant Growth and Eternal Witness and all of these uh, you know cultivates, Kodama's Reaches, and all these mana rocks or whatnot. So as far as if you're on that train of hey, I need a I need a two mana rock. There's tons of them now. They come into play tap sometimes. It's fine. You're going to get there. Uh, and they don't cost anything. Those, uh, what was it, the, the Diamond Cycle that was reprinted in Commander Legends, those are all about a quarter. Go pick them up. Signets, for the most part, are relatively cheap. Um, you know, they put a Solemn and a Burnish Heart in almost every Commander deck now. Uh, you're pretty much good to go on, like, you know, green ramp and non-green ramp, wherever you need it. Uh, card draw isn't there in my opinion, quite yet, at least not to the budget level. Um, we need more, like, sign and blood things that aren't sign and blood or Night's Whisper where they actually cost, like, 2 to $3, because, as as you said, Andy, those add up if you include all of them. Yeah. Uh, but we're getting there. Now, looking at two mana rocks, Arcane Signet being one example, um, <clears throat> I, I've started looking, and I, I'm, I'm, being, I'm becoming more and more aware of it, because, I, I mean, 
I like Arcane Signet. It's it's a great card. Um, people have talked about whether or not it, it was a mistake to have it come, you know, into into the format in, in a precon. Um, but it's been reprinted quite a bit now. Um, I'm not sure uh, that 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 current price of that card. Um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say it's a budget card. Um, but looking at rocks that come in to play tapped, like the Diamond Cycle. So you've got you know uh, Sapphire Diamond. Um, the charcoal diamond i've been looking at it and more and more recently whenever i play my arcane signet on two i'm not doing anything with it so it's no better other than it can tap for either of the, the colors but playing primarily one and two color decks which I, I didn't realize honestly i was doing and it's just i have done it without realizing it it's almost no, no different for me to to play one of those twenty five cent budget cards tapped on turn two than an untapped arcane signet that I'm not doing anything with anyway. Well, that's interesting because I I I I feel like every time I can stick a two mana talisman in a deck, I do every single time. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I do like adding them, and I do add them, but I think if you take a look and maybe, maybe, maybe look for it, but I, uh, I've been watching it. Mm -hmm. And when I'm, when I'm playing them out, I'm not doing anything with them that turn, unless I have a really good turn where I've got, you know, uh, uh, you know, the play where you play a land and then a soul ring and then the arcane signet, like the dream on turn mm -hmm. one, right. or, or you play the, the talisman or the signet on two on two and then still have something to do with it. But most of the time on two, I'm not doing anything with it. So in my, from from what I've seen, at least from this year, I could totally replace my arcane signets and save myself a few bucks on each deck. I'm not doing anything with it. If it's a three or four color deck or five, I guess there's obviously reasons why you'd want to play it. It's, it's certainly better. Right. Um, but the budget version doesn't remove much from a lot of decks. Now, would you believe me if I told you arcane signet is a budget card now? It is. Oh, what is it yes. at now? You can buy one for $1.11 on TCG Player. Nice. Sign us up. It's a budget card, y'all. <laughs> if it spikes, it's because of this show. It's been reprinted oh, enough, yes. just like Soul Ring and Commander Sphere <laughs> and all of that stuff. You can you can literally put it in every deck if you wanted to. Now, at the at the time of Command Fest Chicago, the only way to get an Arcane Signet was from the Brawl decks, and I do remember spending fifteen or twenty dollars on my Arcane Signet. Uh, I did man, the same thing. <laughs> yeah, it's just, just biting yourself in the butt now, knowing that you can get it for under $2. Um, but uh, is there other is there other ways and other strategies that you can have to, you know, uh, counteract like higher level strategies? Like, can you bring um, a budget deck, maybe not to a high power? Well, can you bring a budget deck to a high power pool? or high power pod uh and if so how how do you start competing with them um and if not and if it's only like the mid mid pod or something like a mid level pod um how do you compete there um so i would say if you wanted to bring a uh i i kind of look at it the way that people view uh the competitive formats in magic uh so you know like say hey play mono red it's really good like well it's really good and it costs like nothing uh so if you're wanting to bring a cheap deck to a high power pod not cdh levels because i don't think you can do that <laughs> um leaning in the combo works really well because we stated it earlier uh right. you know again the mario kart thing you're the underdog no one's paying attention to you and that kind of gives you the element of surprise uh the speed also helps with that a little bit so you kind of want to keep it to uh, one or two colors in my opinion so you're not constantly playing your tap lands um you know zada hedron grinder is kind of a meme deck at this point uh, but if you know what it can do, you as soon as she hits the field, it's you have a turn. And it's a month's answer threat. Uh, it's kind of like the perfect combination for what you need. Less colors, uh, the ability to pop off at a moment's notice. It goes a really long way. Uh, more removal does help as well. Uh, if you are playing a, a multicolor deck, three, four, even five, um, you are playing slower. You are going to want to run more interaction just so you can stay in the game so you're not getting overwhelmed. Uh, so if you want to Play more colors, play more removal, in my opinion. Got it. So leaning into combo makes makes total sense. Um, I support that. Having <laughs> a way to, to win that isn't just based on combat damage in general. We, we have said before, so alternate win cons, which works really, really well. And, and a lot of those alternate win con cards are very affordable. They do require you to jump through hoops. Like a, a Maze's End requires a bunch of guild gates. Uh, approach of the Second Sun requires that you cast it two times um 
I, I, I've never uh, won off of ha happily ever after, but I would assume somebody has, and I'm jealous of them. Um, <laughs> so um, now let's talk about some value uh, value cards that um, you can pick up for EDH and, and how you can evaluate valuable cards that really fit the budget and pack a punch. So do you have a way that you, you look at or evaluate new cards when they're coming out to say, I think... I want to play this or I want to get this card because it's it's possible that this might go up in the future. So I uh, get it now while it's at a budget or something you think might be even overhyped um, and, and you know will come down. Um, so the way to evaluate that, the easiest answer is just kind of wait two weeks. I mean, if you're not going to your, uh, <laughs> if you're not going to, um, you know, your pre-release and whatnot um, to, you know, to pick up a couple things, uh, you can probably just wait. Uh, if, Anybody else is on Twitter and remembers the hype uh, that we had for the Disciple of Bolas that that gives you treasures instead of cards? That was pre-ordering for what twenty bucks, and now it's less than two. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. just wait. Um, but as far as how to find those cards, let's say it was the opposite. Uh, things I'm normally looking for are um, anything that gives a color the ability to do something it couldn't really before. A uh, good example here is uh, March of Swirling Mist. Uh, it's a new instant from uh, from Neon Dynasty. It's a blue and an X. Uh, as an initial cost to cast the spell, you may exile any number of blue cards from your hand, and the spell costs two less to cast for each card exiled this way. That part doesn't matter. The, the part that matters is up to X target creatures phase out. Uh, and you can do a lot with that. The card's 59 cents on Card Kingdom right now. Mm-hmm. You can use that on offense. If you need to swing in, you phase out your opponent's creatures, you kill them. Uh, if they're swinging in, you phase out their creatures and you fog them. If there's a board wipe, you phase out your creatures and you're fine. There's just a lot of fun things you can do. It, it's kind of like the, um, the the blue Teferi's Protection, if you will. But it actually, I don't know, it feels a little bit better. It only works on creatures, of course. But, you know, it's another way to look at things, too. If a card looks like another really good card in EDH, like pay attention to it because it, it may just spike just by being the second best version of that card. If they made a Teferi's Protection, the exact same card, and it costs four mana, it'd still be like 20 bucks. Yeah, and the, and and the fact that it's one more mana, that's or or put a second color pip in it or something. I know before we were talking about Aristocrats, and, and we had mentioned Zulaport, Cutthroat, and Blood Artist, both of which are um, definitely more than a dollar. I think Blood Artist even is like five or six dollars for that card, which I, I think Blood Artist is the worst of the two. And that might be a controversial opinion. Uh, and Zulaport <laughs> Cutthroat should be should cost more. But then you have a card like Poison Tip Archer, which is four mana. It, it requires black and green to cast, but it essentially does the same thing. Um, so, it, you know, yeah, increasing the mana cost, increasing the amount of colors that's going to be in there. Uh, and you're essentially going to do the same thing. And that and that also goes into what you've said previously, um, you know, when you're competing against higher decks and stuff, you, everything's going to take a little bit longer and you just want to try to get to the end game because everything costs a little bit more mana. Um, but, you know, so is that something that you also look into? Like, oh, this is the same card, but a little bit more expensive. Or do you gravitate towards cards that might um, be ha harder to cast? I know in, in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, we saw a lot of this this rare cycle where it actually has four pips of the same color, making them, quote unquote, uncastable in non monocolor decks of that color. And that's actually a good thing because it keeps the cost cheap because a lot of people just can't play them in their multicolored decks. Uh, let's let's take Invoke Despair as the example. So that's one in quadruple black. It's a sorcery. So target opponent sacrifices a creature. If they can't, they lose two life and you draw a card. Then you repeat the process for an enchantment and a planeswalker. Uh, this one's special because it gives black another way to get rid of enchantments, which it, it really has a hard time doing. It's gotten a couple tools in the last uh, you know couple years to get around that, you know, for some cost. Uh, but this is all upside. And it's only a quarter and it's at sorcery speed. So, yeah, as you said, if it's um if it's a little more expensive to cast and it's a little bit slower, a lot of like high-powered casual players uh probably won't even look at it or pick it up, uh which gives you the opportunity to, you know, try them out and see how good they are.
It's very interesting that you use that particular card because when we were talking about Kamigawa Neon Dynasty cards, I was very excited about that. And Andy's like, but it's five mana and four pips of black. I'm like, no, 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 it's fine. It's going to be great. And on top of that, it's actually the promo card that comes in the bundle as well. So that probably also has something to do with the price being so low. Well, there we go. I, you know, it's so funny because I, I play two color decks. So I, I will, I will play these cards. Um, but I, I remember Mike was very excited about Invoke Despair. And I was thinking, you run three, four color, five color decks. How are you going to cast this? <laughs> but honestly, I think it's probably easier than, than, than we think to have four black mana in a two color deck. Black, green, I probably, I probably have it more often than I think. Um, but I, I do think it's a great idea. And I like the way that they're, they're, they're designing these cards now that they can do more just by packing more color pips into them. Um, making it less easy to just play in general. Now, here's my favorite part of this episode. I want you to tell us about some of your favorite budget decks and, and we're gonna, we're gonna have you pick your favorite, which, you know, of all the budget decks you've built, tell us about the experience, what you've put together and then which one's your favorite? Well, let's start with the favorite. So you actually all did an episode on uh, what I called my flagship budget deck, which used to be uh, Vadrock Artifacts, which was just, you know, you play a bunch of mutate stuff, you reanimate artifacts and just kind of play the long game, get a bunch mm -hmm. of life, just deal one to two bits of damage here and there and you just go long. Goes infinite with chef's kiss. How could you forget? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh, but my favorite deck and it's, one that I've um, I've actually kept under fifty dollars, you know, just trying new stuff out because I like the deck so much, is Zatalpa, uh, the Primal Dawn. So <laughs> Zatalpa is um, let, let me let me pull it up because it does it does a lot, and I constantly forget like one or two keywords. So it's I'm, six I'm and double white bags. for a four eight legendary creature elder dinosaur. It's got flying, double strike, vigilance, trample, and indestructible. Uh, so I played this on episode nine of Scrap Trawlers, and uh, the more I play it, the more I like it. It does everything I want to do in Magic. It's a meme commander because it's like a big splashy white thing. It's like the original. Oh, it, you know this card costs like nine mana. It's a commander card. It's totally a commander card. <laughs> um, it's got dorks with double strike. I love um, a, a one one with double strike for two mana. Like give me as much as you can. Uh, it's got a ton of equipment and artifacts. Uh, lots of interaction in mono white, a bit of politics, and it wins games sometimes. I know I have been uh, one eight hundred. Are you flapping smacked in the face before? And definitely have. I think I'm. I think yeah. No, if I look at my my uh, gameplay, my my tracked games from twenty twenty one, I have not played against a Zatalpa deck in twenty twenty two. But in twenty twenty one, I am zero and two against a Talpa deck. So for sure, <laughs> I, this is a nemesis of mine. A nemesis. Zatelpa Primal Dawn, the nemesis. And you do have an alternate win con of Approach of the Second Sun in here. So Yeah, and it's it. it's so good. Um that's another thing that's kind of hard to find in budget decks. Alternate win conditions. So the easiest way to win with budget is to put your opponent's life total to zero. And the easiest way to do that is through combat damage. And aggro is kind of difficult to do in a, a multiplayer format. Uh, so that's and that's why I said Voltron is probably one of the better ways to do that because you only need to buff one creature instead of a lot. And when it has indestructible, it's even better. Yeah. And double strike and everything else you love. And I mean, uh, and the other twelve things that are on it. Yes, I do. I do see those. Um, I I like this deck a lot. And also, we're gonna have links to all these below. So if you're interested, we're gonna share Nick's um, architect list. So go. Uh, check out all of those decks. Now, um, Zatelpa is great. Um, I have played against this as well. Um, I have also not won a game against Zatelpa, <laughs> although I'm not sure if Zatelpa won the pod that I was in playing against mm -hmm. it. Um, we might have both lost together, um, but I've definitely never beaten a Zatelpa deck, and that's a fun stat to be able to tell people. Well, I, I've been in it. I've never beaten it. What other commander decks have you built um, that you also thought were really fun and you enjoyed playing? Oh, there's so many. Let me uh, let me pull up my examples on Architect really quick because it just logged me out. Thank you, Architect. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. We've been on. We've been on the Scrap Trawler stream before, Andy. So I know we've we've had to build under some different deck restrictions. Um, 
I know I know one of my favorites was my Croaks deck. And, you know, we talked about before uh, budget on individual cards versus, you know, half your budget into one card. I, I ended up putting World Gorger Dragon combo into my $50 budget deck. Uh, you almost cast it, too. We I, saw it happening. I had, I had it. Someone stopped it, unfortunately. But yes, it, it almost got there. I I put together a green red trample deck is what I played with uh um uh Zalortha strength incarnate so it was the promo from Akoria and so you you had to uh deal damage equal to its uh, power to take out a creature so that was that was a wild deck to play um as far as a budget deck goes um and we had a really good time playing oh, yeah. on those streams you flung and the also... land of world <laughs> <laughs> I flung a land war elf, folks, for the win to take out Andy Zupke. And then, because I knew if it got back to his turn, I wasn't going to win. Um, it was iconic. It was something I will always remember. It's a good And I will never time. let Andy forget. <laughs> uh, another deck and another strategy that's pretty easy to build on a budget. Uh, so my second ever Scrap Trawlers deck, uh, it was Pelucranos Unchained. It was for our Halloween Ooh. episode. And my uh, my theme was Reanimator, like the movie Reanimator. Um, so this one, it's it's actually the perfect deck for a, a card that a lot of people are trying to figure out. Deadbridge Chant. Uh, it's for a green and a black for an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, put the top ten cards of your library into your graveyard. On your upkeep, choose a card at random in your graveyard. If it's a creature card, put it onto the battlefield. Otherwise, put it into your hand. And the reason this works really well with Pelucranos Unchained is because uh, Pelucranos has escape for four, a black, and a green. So you, you pay that, and you exile six other cards from your graveyard, and it enters the battlefield as a 12-12, and it can fight things. But that means your Dead Bridge chant can just reanimate whatever you didn't exile with escape. So that's really fun. That's really smart. I only ever played Dead Bridge chant in my Marin of Clan Neltoth deck. That's really, really smart in Pelucranos. I'm I'm blown away by that interaction. Is that I'm gonna check EDA track and see if that's like a top thing <laughs> that people are building Pelucranos. <laughs> Watch it on one of our upcoming streams when Mike builds it very soon. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's a lot of fun. Uh do you have do you have any other um like decks that maybe people would look at the commander and and instantly be scared of it but you you have to like you know curb their uh expectations by saying that it's budget or vice versa maybe uh, a commander that's very um uh I, I don't know the word i'm looking for it doesn't look very strong but the deck itself unassuming. is actually unassuming that's a good that's, there's a good word right there let's go with the first example so another one of my scrap trawlers decks uh which i might put back together because it's just really meme -y. Uh, it's Samut Voice of Descent, which, if, if you don't know that one, it's three, a red, and a green for a legendary creature, Human Warrior. It's got Flash, Double Strike, Vigilance, and Haste. <laughs> it gives other creatures you control have Haste, and you can pay white and tap it to untap another target creature, and it's a 3-4. So, that one, it's that, that sets off alarm bells. Mm -hmm. As soon as you see that, it's like, okay, you're going to put some Swords of X and Y on it, and it's going to be really painful. Until you tell your opponents, hey... This is a spell shapers deck. Oh, and they that? go, what? Do, you, what? what do you mean by that? So um, this was a deck that I built where it, it was tribal. And this was one, like, one of the harder ones we had to do. Uh, if you want to try to build a cheap tribal deck, pick a really bad tribe. <laughs> okay. Um, so spell shapers, they do one thing. Uh, that, that's kind of like their lore. Like they're, they're super mages. They do their one thing very well. But at the cost of tapping them, paying some mana and discarding a card, it's all card disadvantage. Um, so, like, for example, we have Flowstone Channeler. Uh, it's two and a red for a human spell shaper. <laughs> it's a 2-2. Two -two. You pay one and a red, tap it, and discard a card. Target creature gets plus one, minus one, and gains haste until after turn. <laughs> oh, okay. That's uh, not a whole lot of value for a whole lot of cost there. Um, I imagine a lot of them are, are very similar to that. I mean... Um... Yeah, there, there are some that are, like, pretty decent, Um Probably one of the better ones is Dawn Strider. Uh, it's a one in the green for a 1-1. One, one, uh, I think it's a Dryad Spell Shaper. Uh, you pay a green, tap it, and discard a card, and you fog. So you can just okay. do that every turn. Now, I'm I'm very curious on how this particular Samut deck would, would uh, 
fair against my my Samut deck, which isn't necessarily built on a budget, but it only has images of humanoids yelling and screaming is is the theme of my deck. Um, I'm curious to see how they would fare against each other. It could be it could be a lot of fun of our Samuts just killing each other over and over again because <laughs> that's the best creature in the whole deck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nick, thank you so much for your support of our show. We honestly cannot thank you enough. Um, we were really happy um, to have you on the episode this week. Um, again, like I mentioned, we're going to share the links to your decks below. Um, but is there any other, uh, you know, parting words or, or uh, information you want to share or tell everybody where they can find you online to chat with you personally? Yeah, um, so I'll sign off with um, why budget is important. Uh, so keeping the game cheap means keeping the game alive. Uh, the more, uh, and that kind of goes beyond Commander too. that's all of Magic. The more financially accessible the game is, the easier it is for new players to jump in and become a lifelong fan. Uh, I know everybody wants to play with the most powerful and busted stuff. I mean, like, who doesn't? Uh, not everyone can. Not everyone also wants to play against it. Uh, budget is less about power matching and more about being able to play with just about anyone who walks through your door at your LGS. Those are great words. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, we certainly understand um, <clears throat> the need um, to, to keep the game affordable. We've talked about it in the past. So mm -hmm. um, the more people we can play with, the better time we're going to have. And, and we certainly don't want uh, the game to end either. So um, couldn't couldn't agree more. Um, Nick, thank you so much for being on our show yes, this week. Thank you. Um, this was a lot of fun. Um, now, if you want to find me online, you can find me on Twitter at Andy Flory. And you can find me on Twitter at Worm Coil Engine. Of course, we want to give a special thanks to Ryan Nichols, our producer and editor. Thank you so much for everything that you do. And Chris Wolf, who handles all of our graphic design, check out his thumbnails over on our YouTube channel for our Commander gameplay. Thank you so much for everything that you do. And to all of you out there, we will chat with you next week. Goodbye. Bye.